Welcome back to the London Free Press podcast. Uh, I have to address a quick elephant in the room. Obviously, I am not Craig Needles. My name is Lindsay Barnett. Craig has moved on to future endeavors in his career, but not before graciously passing the torch to me. I've got about 10 years experience in London media, specifically in radio. I'm also new to the podcast game, but I'm so, so excited to be here and to be part of the team with the London Free Press. Excited for this first episode too. I'm joined by London Free Press City Hall reporter, Megan Stacy. Megan, this one's interesting because you and I know each other personally and now we're working together professionally. But I have to know, Tuesday was so busy for City Council. And what's going on? I'm dreading saying this. What's going on with River Road Golf Course? I'm so excited that we can talk about this, Lindsay. Nothing like a five, six hour city council meeting to like really get you going for a podcast. But I also have to say we're so lucky to have you. We got two of the best hosts ever for our podcast. So this is going to be wonderful. So to backtrack a little bit to Tuesday, uh, it was a long, long meeting, lots of talk about COVID recovery. And then right at the end, I think the debate didn't start till about 9pm. They started talking about River Road. So we know the golf course, um, it, it's been kind of on the brink for a number of years. There's been uh, various discussions at city council about whether it's time to get rid of that course. And so the city owns three different golf properties uh, and River Road has kind of been that, that ugly duckling of the bunch. Um, it has not made very much money and it's a bit of a trickier course I hear. I've never been on it myself, but a trickier course I hear. So um, not a lot of people were using River Road. Uh, and last year, of course, uh, when COVID hit, um, there was a huge demand for tea times at the city's municipal city owned courses. Uh, but River Road Council decided to keep that closed. Um, staff had argued that there was a risk of losing money, about 80 grand over the course of the season. Uh, turned out we actually lost a lot more on our city owned courses altogether last season. Um, and so on Tuesday night, there was kind of the, the final debate the end of the road for River Road. Uh, and it was a pretty quick decision, um, although it's taken like more than a decade to get here. So it depends on how you're looking at it. Uh, but there was a, uh, a vote finally to close the course for good and sell off uh, that land. So it's a city asset for sure. Um, and it'll go through the city hall process for getting rid of uh, land, which is a special sale process. You've got to offer it to a certain number of uh, of buyers first because it's a municipal property. So we're not sure yet what's gonna happen there, uh, but we know that River Road will no longer be a city owned course. Um, and as we've seen, that's kind of triggered some uh, some upset folks. The golfers are not happy about that, <laughs> not at all. Of course, the interesting thing I found watching this all unfold on Tuesday was it seemed like kind of a quick decision and you would know better than me covering city hall so frequently but it just seemed, I thought it would have been a longer discussion and it was just like a finite decision. And I know there were a couple, a handful of counselors, Councillor Van Hole said, this is a done deal decision. Like we can't go back on this. Um, were you surprised by that at all? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I think there's a couple of factors there. One, I don't know about the counselors, but I was getting pretty tired after five hours of a council meeting. They do not normally go that long. This is a council that likes to be pretty quick, especially once you've gotten through all the debate at the committee level, because all of those decisions first go to committee and then come to council. Uh, so I think I think that had a little bit to do with it. Um, it was pretty short. You know, I was expecting like a real feisty debate, and I think we actually got that earlier. Um, last year and even earlier this year. So we've got to keep in mind, this is like about the third time in, you know, a calendar year that River Road and sort of the fate of the course has been discussed. So it came last year in 2020, you know, that was a big decision and staff had just uh, suggested closing the course temporarily for the one season, um, you know, because of COVID impacts and because of the cost uh, to maintain and operate. Um, during the 2020 golf season. So was a, there was a huge, huge debate um, back in 2020. And then we also had uh, a very uh, feisty debate earlier this month when it came to like committee of the whole. So all of the counselors were there or, or are present um, members of that committee. And so it's kind of like a, 
uh, a test run for the debate you're going to get at council right and so for something really contentious like the golf course it's not unusual to have it flare up again at council and we did see that a little bit right you had a couple of motions um sort of a couple last ditch attempts uh, from councillors who wanted to keep the course open at least for a year kind of a stopgap measure to see um really if they could prove that uh, the demand is still going to be there and then make another bid to keep the course i, I assume make a, another bid later to keep the course open for much longer so i think you're right it was short um you know for what we might have expected there were something like 55 letters to council from uh, golfers i don't think there was a single letter that said yes you should close this golf course and they that was all... leading into tuesday's council meeting wasn't it yeah yeah and so they they were on the agenda for that committee of the whole meeting earlier this month but yeah in the time between that committee and and this council meeting on tuesday um there was a lot a lot of communication between the golf uh, golfers and the golf community to counselors um, you know, and I think there were a lot of valid questions too that were asked, right? And that's sort of why you see some of those last ditch motions. Um, Councillor uh, Van Meerbergen and Van Holst were pushing, you know, let's just have that extra year. Let's see what we can do with this course before we make a decision. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, they're, they're pointing out um, a, that people are, are desperate for recreational activities right now. We all know that there's not much to do uh, amid COVID. And that was certainly the case last summer when, when golf, um, you know, the demand really spiked. And then Councillor Hopkins too, uh, who I'm not sure that she's a city politician that you might expect to really jump on the like, let's save the golf course train. Um, but she has an unusual ward, Ward 9. I expect she's got a lot of golfers there. And she said she heard loud and clear, you know, that people want recreational opportunities. People are attached to this course. Uh, and so the motion she put forward, uh, it didn't go anywhere either, was let's have um, more public discussion about what to do with that land before just getting rid of it. Um, so none of those councillors had any success uh, stalling the decision, as we know. So it was a decision to both close the course for good, uh, stop operating as a golf course, and then also sell the land. So it'll depend, uh, you know, who buys it, what happens there next. But um, anyway, overall, as you say, I, I do think it was a quicker decision, but you also got to keep in mind the lead up you know, not just this month, but last year and really the last decade of discussing what to do with this thing. I think a lot of what I'm reading too from the public pushback, and there has been a ton, is as you mentioned, it wasn't opened last summer. And last summer, we were still trying to figure out the pandemic. Everything was still so new. There wasn't a lot of recreational stuff you could do safely with other people. And all of a sudden, non-golfers became golfers. And getting a tea time, whether it was a city-owned golf course or not, was insane. It was really, really difficult. And so I just wonder if most of the pushback is like, should they have given it another season ago, like Paul Van Meerbergen had mentioned or not? What else are you hearing now that the decision has been definitive from these golfers? Yeah, absolutely. They're definitely saying what you're saying, Lindsay, you know, uh, a, we didn't even have a chance to show you, you know, that we will use this course and that we love that course. That's what some golfers are saying. And especially now that the decision has been made. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of factors going into this, right? Really, it's a, a dollars and cents decision from a political perspective, right? So the argument from city staff was that if you keep River Road open and you risk, you know, continued losses there year after year, you're going to put the entire uh, municipal golf system, the other two city owned properties and the other golf courses that the city owns uh, at risk because there's like $6 million expected um, in needed repairs and upkeep over the next decade, already uh, about a million dollars like is needed now that we're already behind on. And so the point from city staff is, listen, if you've got this course that's you know losing money almost every year, it's gonna be a drag on the entire system and you're gonna put your other courses at risk. So that's kind of the ultimate decision, right? And I think what you heard from a lot of politicians is, okay, I mean, we could keep this open another year, but what does that really do for us? There may be a huge demand to golf this summer because we know COVID's not gonna probably be solidly in the rearview mirror by this summer. Um, and so I think a lot of politicians were saying, you know, what, what does that really show us? We could have demand, but it's still expected that once we can travel again, once we can do some of these other uh, fun summer activities that we all count on, 
the demand is probably going to settle down, right? Uh, and so a lot of politicians were saying, listen, you know, we, we can't go ahead with this. But what you asked about was golfers. And so what the golfers are saying now <laughs> is, um, you know, listen, you, we have supported the municipal uh, golf system for years and years and years. And back in the day, it was actually making money. So now we're having some troubles, right? But back in the day, it was making money. Uh, and sort of at the peak, there were revenues um, over and above what it costs to operate the golf courses. Like we're talking a million bucks. And so they were reinvested back into other city uh, recreation um, activities, right? And so the golfers are saying, listen, you know, in our good times, we supported the rest of the city owned rec facilities. You know, where is that same treatment? for now our courses, now that we're running into trouble, right? And so this idea that golf pays for golf, which is always how the city has run its systems, that the fees and revenues from those golf courses will, will pay for the cost of operating. Um, that's really no longer the case. We don't have enough, golf isn't making enough money to pay for golf. Um, and they're saying like, listen, now's our time. You know, the city pays for hockey arenas, for, uh, you know, aquatics. Let's have, you know, the same treatment for golf. And um, I think a lot of golfers, especially those who are buying in and, you know, paying memberships, uh, especially in, in the heyday when golf was making money are saying like, that's what we deserve now, right? Like, what about us? And so a uh, fair point for sure, I think. Um, and some politicians addressed that on Tuesday too. I think it was Councillor Turner who said, you know, for him, it's a question about the cost of entry. Um, and that something like a swimming lesson is more accessible for more people than, uh, you know, heading for a round at the golf course. And so the city's got to make some difficult decisions about what to fund. Um, and, you know, that golf maybe doesn't make make the cut. So uh, it's interesting. I think a lot of golfers, too, uh, they're not just frustrated, they're mad, right? And so they're saying, listen, you closed one of our courses. We asked you not to, like we, you, we would have supported that city owned course. And so we're gonna take our memberships elsewhere. We saw that was a, a big theme uh, across the letters that came to council. And I'm sure there were a number of, number of people who were writing to their, their counselors privately too, that, you know, I haven't seen those communications, but a lot of people were threatening to take their memberships elsewhere. So it'll be interesting to see if, how that plays out and um, whether we do see a decline. I, I sort of suspect that you're going to have um, the same number of, of people or, or at least similar demand for, for golf this summer. Uh, but you know, it's, it's worth asking because there's a lot of courses around London um, and a lot of private courses that may have more of an accessible price point, right? Not every private course around here is like a very ritzy, expensive, you know, join a clubhouse kind of a, a thing. So it'll be interesting to see if you do kind of see that exodus of, um, of golfers that are no longer willing to purchase uh, city memberships. I think you make a very valid point. I can also appreciate the position the city is in having to liquidate some assets. Now, like you said, this is going to be an option for several types of buyers. Is there any speculation as to who might already be interested? It's a very desirable piece of property. Any idea of what might become of it once it is sold and who it might be sold to? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question um, because there's been a lot of push, I would say, from the golf community to say, and this was mainly before the decision um, was made, you know, to say, give the private sector a chance, right? Is there an opportunity here for a public private partnership? You know, keep it open as a golf course, but kind of help the city out um, when it comes to the bottom line. And so there was a proposal from what looks to be a local organization that seemed to be interested in sort of running uh, River Road and actually some of the other city owned courses as a golf course. So, um, you know, I, I'm not uh, super embedded in the, the real estate market. I couldn't tell you that for sure, but I think there has been some interest. So it's going to be interesting to see if that materializes in terms of, you know, offers on the table. Um, there's also been a lot of talk about, is this a good place for some other kind of development, right? Because golf is, um, you know, sort of the COVID demand aside, uh, golf is in decline in this country. Uh, there's been a lot of courses that have been turned into housing. Um, and so a lot of people have been asking the question, is that what's going to happen here? Uh, and I think you're right, you know, any sort of city owned land, um, you know, that that's a pretty important asset and you want to weigh out what's going to happen to it. But the interesting thing too about River Road is that 
there's only about 11 acres, I think it is, of that property that is developable. And a lot of it um, is prone to flooding. There's some issues with, you know, water that would cover the course. And so that's going to pose a problem, um, you know, for somebody who would want to come in and say, build condos um, on the land. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens that I've also heard a lot of golfers who say, listen, the city's not going to get anywhere near uh, what was paid for that property um, right. back in 2018, I believe. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that uh, comes up and, and the timeline on it too, right? A couple of counselors uh, asked on Tuesday, is it possible to keep um, operations going there as this kind of moves through the city hall process for selling off land and, and selling the public asset. So um, that was a no. <laughs> so really the, the course is just going to sit as it is until until it's sold, um, assuming that it can be sold. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there for sure. Perfect. Well, Megan, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you so much for joining my first episode of the London Free Press podcast. As always, you're so wonderful to work with. Excited to see kind of what happens with this. Um, and my heart kind of bleeds for the golfers who are so passionate about this course. Um, and thank you for listening. Don't forget, you can find us Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We are on YouTube and of course, over at lfpress.com. I'm your host, Lindsay Barnett. We will be back next week with another episode of the London Free Press podcast. Until then, stay well.